Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. There's a well-known Rodgers and Hammerstein song from South Pacific. It's entitled, You've Got to Be Carefully Taught. It's a song about how children learn to hate and fear people who don't look like they do, come from a different culture, are other in some way. For thousands of years, the Jew has been the other. And even today, there are cultures which teach their children to hate and fear Jews. And more specifically, in some quarters of the Muslim, Arab, and Palestinian world, Israelis. And while my experience and in all the conversations I've had with Israelis, I find there's not a similar hate of Palestinians or Arabs. There are, in some Israeli communities, a fear of the other, in this case, the Palestinians. Maybe even some hate. And to many Israelis and American Jews who believe that the only way there will ever be real peace between Jew and Arab, between Israeli and Palestinian, is for Israeli and Palestinian children to learn that there's no need to hate or fear each other. If a new generation of Palestinian children can be brought up experiencing Israeli Jews in a warm, intimate setting, and if Jewish children can grow up alongside Palestinian children, become friends with each other, real friends, then maybe the years of Palestinian rejectionism, rejecting the state of Israel, and Israeli mistrust of Palestinian intentions, maybe one day they can all be washed away. It's a dream. But Zionism was built on a dream. As Theodor Herzl prophesied, if you will it, it is no dream. Today I want you to meet a dreamer. His name is Amir Shlomian, who's created a daring experiment, a school, where Jewish and Arab children learn together. The school is called Ein Bustan. It's located in the Lower Galilee, in the midst of a Jewish village and Bedouin villages. And at the Ein Bustan Kindergarten and Elementary School, up to the third grade, all classes, Jewish and Arab Israelis, sitting together, learning together, studying together, inevitably becoming friends with each other. Amir Shlomian is a professional musician by trade, by training, having studied in Paris. And then he returned to Israel to teach music. And then in 2005, Amir founded Ein Bustan. And Amir, it's such a pleasure to have you sitting with me at this table. Thank you so much. This is a very special, lovely human being. Thank mm. you for joining us. Thank you for the presentation. Wow. <laughs> I'm really deeply touched. Thank you. Yes. All right, I first want to talk a little bit about you, and then we'll come to Ein Bustan. Okay. Please, yes. Um, tell me, first of all, were you born in Israel? Mm -hmm. You're a Sabra. Mm -hmm. You Sabra. were born yes, where? Yes, I am. I was born in the middle of Israel, and the, actually my childhood I passed there, not far away from Tel Aviv, north of Tel Aviv, a place called Ramat Sharon. Okay. Uh, didn't meet so many Arabs. Actually, I couldn't, I could count them probably on my hand. I bet. On one hand, yes. Where were your parents from? My father was born in Baghdad, Iraq. Uh -huh. He spoke Arabic with my grandmother, but I didn't come to learn that because he couldn't speak it with my mother. What my, is his name? What his, was name his name is Yaakov. Yaakov. Yes. And my family name is actually from his father's side, which is Iranian. He came, he's Kurdish from Iran. Um, and my mother was born in Russia. And uh, her name? Her name is Dvora, Deborah. So you come from the Sephardic world, correct? Actually, I come from, the, from both. Myself because and Because your mother because, is Ashkenazic. Yes, yes. Actually, yes. Ashkenazic came from a kibbutz. And actually, we felt both uh, cultures. And many times... I was asked whether I am Ashkenazi yes, or Sephardi, yes. 
Uh, in my own family, they, by the way of Luke, my two elder, older brothers, Luke a bit darker than me, and me and the, the fourth one got the fair eyes and a bit fairer skin. So normally I used to be the Ashkenazi in the family. <laughs> yes. And you know, Amir, very often the kind of marriage that your parents entered into was called an intermarriage in the state of Israel because the cultures were, they brought very different perspectives, first of all, to the Jewish life, and their history was different. If I were in your home growing up with you, what kind of Jewish home did you have? Um, it's true that actually we had, we had quite a mixture, yes. Um, I knew that we are a mixed family. I couldn't feel any any problem with it. Uh, I had the stories about the, how hard it was for my father to be accepted in my mother's family. Yes, he was a generation before you, yeah. and Sephardic Jews had a much harder time then. Yes. He had the, through um, some trails, he had to eat certain things, and he knew that actually he's going to chew it and swallow it, and it will be fine. But you know, the way actually his being was so vivid and so loving that um, he got into my grandmother's heart and <laughs> at the end of the uh, at the end of her life I think she she loved him the best you know okay so. I want to make sure but I, I think I understand what you're saying you know it's amazing how cultures have their own foods and each culture not only is comfortable with their own foods but somehow thinks everybody eats that way and yet, people who come from an Ashkenazic or a Sephardic background, very often their foods are different. Are you saying that one of the problems your father faced was that when he went to your mother's parents' home, they had Ashkenazic food which he was not used to. He ate it because he had to. And in the end, what you're saying is he became so beloved, even though he had this problem initially, that he becomes one of your fa one of the favorites of your mother's parents. Exactly. I have it correctly. Yes, you got it correctly, and it, it became a joke, you know. Yes. <laughs> that Auntie Rachel, sister of my grandmother, said, "Well, he ate the whole thing, so he's, <laughs> he's, he must be fine." Okay. okay. Yes. By the time you come along and you're born and you are raised as an Israeli, is the Sephardic Ashkenazic distinction so relevant? Um, yeah, very much. It is funny because I was raised in, in a school that was supposed to be a mixed. It, it was mixed. That, that we called it, you know, the, a mixed school because it was for Ashkenazi and Sephardi together. I didn't got the meaning because I didn't know what am I, who am I, you know, in, in that sense. For me, it, it was meaningless. But at the time, it was very, very relevant. Did you ever deal with discrimination in Israel because you were Sephardi? Um, vice versa, I believe. Uh, more those kids in the classroom who actually took me as an Ashkenazi because they were full Sephardi. It took them a while to, to like me. Um, I never took it as a problem. I never felt. Um, I was never taken actually as a Sephardi. Normally I was taken as an Ashkenazi. Okay. You become a musician. How does that happen? Were you into music as a child? Yes, I'm, I'm, actually I was into music since my birth. I always, actually I always had notes in my head and, and figured melodies and... Really? Yes, and I did not realize that it's not always like that. It took me a while to understand that actually I got a gift. Then at class three, four, five, when I gave the harmonies for songs, and the music teacher realized that actually I could sit n near the piano and accompany all the children. I've done that without knowing that actually other people read it from, from sight, you know, they need it to be written. You play and, by and so ear. On. I played by ear. Now, no. Now I play also, right, yeah. because you're a trained musician now. Yes, but I played by ear and I didn't know that it is a gift. Yes. Then nowadays people sometimes phone me to ask me whether I could write a melody that they will sing in a phone or something like this. And I realized that actually it is a, it's a gift. Uh, though I didn't think that I'm going to study it or to teach it, teach it because it was so, it, it was part of me. It was so deep in my body, I couldn't, um, I couldn't see it. You end up studying in Paris. How does that happen? Um, I wanted to see the world a little bit and to see where I could actually... Is this after service? You were in the army? Yes, I was in the army, in the medicine force. You were? Yes. Were you trained? 
Yes. I by was, the army? Yeah, trained by the army as a medic, and then I was a, a guide for other medics and guide for uh, military um, medical forces who serve together, you know, where we got few medics and a doctor and they should know how to do the work together. Yes. So I was the one who trained them. That's lovely. Yeah. Did you ever have to see action? Um, no, actually no. Good. Never, never. Good. You were lucky. Yeah. Okay. So you trained as a medic, you served the, your time in the army, and then after the army you want to see the world, you, and that's how you end up in Paris studying music? Exactly. Actually, you know, I, I, in a way my my path took me into education, which I, I, it's something else that I wouldn't believe if you might have told me when I was a high school um, student that I'm going to be an educator, I would probably have laughed, really, because I, I did not finish my high school. I did my studies at home, and I did my AO level alone, and I somehow I could not... Uh, I couldn't cope with the system until the, the ninth grade. I was a great student, all very beloved by the, by the teachers. By the 10th grade, something happened. And then really? I, I, couldn't, I couldn't finish oh, it. Talk to me about that for a moment. Mm. First of all, did, be, did you become a discipline problem? Uh, yeah, absolutely, yes. You rebelled in some way. Yes. Okay, you, Amir, I know you've given this thought. What was happening inside you that you rebelled in the way you did? Mm. And as we talk about this, I really want to understand the extent to which it shaped who you become as an adult. You know, Ilan told me you're a very clever guy. So. <laughs> <laughs> and Mark, I must tell you, you're so, your honesty and the way you ask me, wow, you opened my heart. So uh, I'll tell you everything. <laughs> uh, well, I remember myself at class seven, seventh grade, walking uh, outside in the, um, in the garden of school and not accepting what I was just taught about the Holocaust. I couldn't stand the uh, regular way it was taken, as if there's only one people to be blamed uh, and one people that was actually a victim, because I could feel that I could be both. And I knew that actually uh, something in this uh, system teach me not correctly and not honest enough. So I could do mathematics good and you know all the lessons fairly good, but what I needed as education, my food you know, for the soul was not given to me. That's what I felt. I, I'm not blaming any of my teachers. They were really fine people and, and they did their best, but at, that, uh, at the age of 13, 14, 15, I couldn't stand it anymore. I was at class eight when I first thought that it's not for me. Class nine, I was at the, uh, uh, one of the offices of the heads of the Ministry of Education, and I said that I want to open an external file in order to make my AO levels faster and to finish with that story. And I remember this, uh, you know, sort of officer. His answers were really, really cruel and, and rude. He said very awful things that I think you shouldn't say to a kid. I was a kid yet. And uh, in a way, it, it convinced me even more that I can, cannot stay in the system. So he forced me to finish grade 10. And that's why at grade 9, I was yet very nice guy at grade 10. I think I was sort of hell for my teachers. Mm -hmm. They're not to be blamed. It's because of that officer who, who forced me to do it. He said, otherwise, I will not let you go to AO level, and you will not have your baccalaureate. So that's how I find myself out of the system at the, the age of you 15. Did, you dropped out of school every 10th grade? I went out. I left it. So yes. you never got a high school diploma? I did. Because in Israel, what you need in order to have high school diploma is to, to make the exams, AO level. And there is a way to do it alone, external. Most of the, of the kids who are going out of school and want to do that, they, they join a private school, what we call Limudei uh, Chutz, or you know, any external school for, uh, for having the, the AO level. But I did it alone, with no teachers at home. And then you took the tests and you passed the tests. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Can you remember what was the way in which the Holocaust was presented to you as a student 
in the eighth, ninth grade, which you say to yourself, as an adult now, even now, if I were to teach the Holocaust in Israel, in a Jewish school, I would want to teach it how. What's the difference? What, what, what's the nuance, Amir, you would add? What I missed is the compassion to, the, to both sides. What's the both sides? The victim and the murderer. Okay, are we saying that you did not feel there was enough compassion for the German people? Uh, yeah, yes. That's, you know, to make it as simple as possible. Yes, I felt that there's something actually, uh, it, I, I, well, I remember that time, I felt that actually I'm walking on a very dirty ground because it happened. Uh, I'm sorry, because what happened? Because the World War II happened. It took me a while to understand that actually crimes like that were actually, it was not first time to, to happen, though, of course, in different sizes, and we, we all know that actually it is something in, incomparable to anything else. Exactly. Yet, yes, I'm with you, it's true. Yet, uh, humankind got this uh, possibility always. Sur mera asetov, that's what we say. Uh, take the path of the good and stay away from bad things. Sur mera asetov, that's my, my phrase, you know, it's very Jewish to me. This is, uh, that's the, the purest Judaism for me. Mi ha'ish ha'fetz chayim, the man who, who, uh, who desire. wishes, desire, yes, for life. Uh, so maybe you could translate it even better than I. No, you're doing very, um, very well, yes. Um, so, you know, I felt that actually uh, there is evil in the world and it is not only for Germans. I could actually touch it myself. Yes. And, yeah, but, but, and again, I, want, I, don't, I don't want anyone to misunderstand either you or what I'm saying. You and I agree there is something unique about the evil of the Holocaust. There is something unique, not simply in its gross large number, but I, I don't know if you agree with me, Amir. I am impatient with people who say that the real horror of the, horror of the Holocaust is that 6 million Jews died, 12 million people were put to death or who died in the Holocaust. Six yeah. million were, were yeah. Jews. I'm with you. I'm okay. with you. Yes. It's I, not I'll tell you what. It's not yeah. the number that bothers me. It no. is the motivation that bothers me. It's the joy. There are people who took joy in making human beings into less than human beings. Yeah. And then I say, you understand that the pain a parent feels at the loss of a child is no different whether the person who the, whether the parent is a Jew, a non-Jew, a Vietnamese, a Vietnamese mother who sees her child napalmed in front of her eyes. The pain of losing a child is horrific no matter what. And there is, and I believe it's possible, and I want to hear whether you agree with me, I believe it's possible to feel two things at the same time. The Holocaust is the ultimate Jewish tragedy. It's my family's tragedy. And there also is something diabolical in it. 100% but it does with you. It yes. mean, it doesn't mean that the Jews are the only people to have experienced pain. And the Jewish obligation is to help other people be spared from pain. The Jewish tradition mandates, it's an obligation, it's a mitzvah for every Jew to do everything he can to protect the other people from pain. Yeah. And to and find pain compassion is to universal. any creature. Yes. That is correct. Yes. Yes. That does not minimize ever no. my commitment to the Jewish people no. or my understanding of how horrific the just, pain the Jew. Actually, but just it, the opposite. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. By doing that, I am a Jew. That's why I, don't, I want to, to be as compassionate as possible towards any creature. And I, I, I will say something more. I 100% take what you said, and thank you for putting it in English so nicely. I wish I could. Um, I know that the, the, the murderer himself is a victim, on, oh, though it's hard for me even to, to understand how. You are how. right. You are right. Now, uh, just to, to make you sure that I'm with you 100%, I don't know how I'm going to teach the Holocaust yet. I don't have an answer yet. The kids in our school, uh, the, the oldest are nine years old. 
And uh, I thank God that I got a few more years to understand how I'm going to get to this, uh, to this point. And, but if you want, I could share with you what happened at the Memorial Day for the Holocaust. Please. Yes, and the Memorial Day for uh, soldiers, Israeli soldiers, you know, in Israel. And I'm in a classroom, mixed classroom, of Muslims and Jews together. And we know that at 11 o'clock we're going to have uh, the alarm. Uh, this particular day was a memorial for the, uh, for the Holocaust. And the... Um, this is Yom HaZikaron. Yom HaZikaron, La Shoah, okay. and, and La Gvura. That, and there's this time in Israel, I believe it's 11 a.m. 11 a.m., morning. A.m., there's a siren goes off. Yes. Everything stops. And we got it, the alarm. Okay. Yes. And you know this is going to happen. Yes, I know it's going to happen. Okay. And there's a question, should all the kids stand in, in honor of, the, of what exactly, in memory of, of what exactly, and what should I do now? Because and you have both Israeli and Muslim Israelis in your classroom. Yes, so I have Jews and Muslims yes. together in the classroom. Yes. I leave aside the question whether they, are, whether they are Israelis or Palestinians or whatever. By, uh, by um, citizenship, they are Israelis. But, you know, I, I don't mind for them to choose whatever they want uh, by identity, self-identity. But anyhow, at that point, just before having it, I let the kids understand that we must be quiet and uh, we must uh, give respect to others who want to stand. You don't have to stand. Uh, by that, I, I stood myself. By that, I took away the sting that made many of my mates in early childhood of mine laugh at when we had the alarm. Because it was always such a tense, and all of 30 kids in the classroom might think, what am I supposed to think about now? I should think about painful things, but what exactly? Very sad things, but what exactly should I do now in that uh, minute, minute and a half or two minutes, you know? It's a long time. And for a kid to stand, of course, many of them started to giggle. And then they might even be punished for giggling, which is, it makes no sense to me. So I, in, that, in that way, actually, we, none of the kids giggled. None of them was um, doing any noise. And actually, I have some very active kids in the classroom, thank God. I love them that way. And they, when it finished, then they asked me, so what was it? And they, I opened the question for the, for the kids. I said, well, what do you know about it? Because I didn't want to catch them in other places than where they are now, in their knowledge. They're only, they were seven and eight years old. It's only this year that they're coming to be nine years old. So seven and year, eight years old. First, I want to, to find out what do they know. So one of the girls raised her hand and she said, I know that somewhere, I don't know where exactly, but I think it's in a very far country. Somebody came to my grandmother. No, not my grandmother. Maybe grandmother of my grandmother. I don't know exactly. And killed her for not being part of his people. And then another girl raised her hand and asked, but how could he know that she's not part of his people? And actually, the, the two girls were a Jew and a Muslim. And then the first one, was the first one is a Jew, and the second one is a Muslim. And I said, well, could we sometimes figure out whether someone is from our people or our team or our group or not. And it's funny, it was asked because the, the teacher who te taught with me at the time, Hasna, a Muslim uh, lady, she's covered. And the girls, Jewish and Arab, used to put uh, things on their head in order to be closer to Hasna because they loved her so, so much. And they pretended and saying, I'm Hasna today and I'm the teacher. So it is funny that she didn't realize that, that actually there are ways to figure out who is what. But OK, if that's, th that's what I meant. You know, I wanted to know where are the kids exactly in their souls, in their knowledge. What do they know? So we had a whole conversation about, could we figure out who, is be who belongs to which people? And uh, after that, uh, they asked me, then, you know, after all this, this uh, discussion, they wanted to hear the, the teacher's question. So tell us now, what's that alarm for? 
I know now I cannot ex escape. So I, you know, I prefer normally to have questions than have answers. Also for myself, you know. And yet, if you'll ask me if I have questions, I have answers for everything. I have questions more than answers. And I'm happy to be in that position, but I had to have an answer for the kids, and I hope the audience would like it. And if not, it's fine. I, I'll be very happy to discuss it, you know. Uh, what I said is, you know, kids, sometimes when you go to a break from, from a lesson to a lesson, you might misbehave. You even sometimes fight between yourself. And then what should you do? And they said, go to the teacher, of course. I said, right. If you're good, then you go, you go to the teacher. But, you know, adults may have the same problem sometimes, too. And one of them said, what? Misbehaving? <laughs> I said, yes. <laughs> sometimes they even misbehave. And even sometimes they might argue and sometimes even fight. And one of the kids, I know everybody wants to know whether it is a Jew or a Muslim. It was a Muslim kid. He, he said, and then you have wars because he was thrilled by the war that we had a, uh, a year and a half before, the Gaza war, and he couldn't leave. You know, he had no where, any other way, you know, to leave the, the village and because uh, grandmother is there and grandfather is there and all, uh, uncles and aunts are there. I myself, I left my home and went to relatives, you know, place, but he couldn't. So he was really afraid of, of that alarm. And uh, he said, and then we have war. I said, All right, sometimes it might come even to a point of a war. And this alarm is in order to remind us that we are all brothers and sisters and adults as children, we should know how to behave. And if we have a problem, we could always find a teacher, older men, older women, some wise people could really help us to solve a problem if we need it and not to fight and not to make bad things to each other because it is painful and we don't want it. And then was something really touching. One of the girls asked, so why is it such a painful, ugly sound? And I told her, well, maybe in some time, if we will keep doing what we're doing together, maybe we could get to a position to change it one day. But what would you like it to be? She said, me, myself, I'd rather have beautiful bells. <laughs> All around, I want just bells to, to remind us to behave. Just like we do in the classroom, because actually we, we ring with a bell. Yeah, so, you know, that's a connection maybe between what happened to me when I was at grade seven, eight, nine, not accepting the way I was taught and what I'm trying to do now with the kids. And we could actually, of course, take the parallel story of, of, in, in com comparable. But talking about wars, about minority and majority, and suffer and victims. Yeah, I think we could, we could share those thoughts and see how could we take it into daily education. By the way, uh, we have a mutual friend, Amir and I. His name is Ilan Safiti. Does extraordinary work here in America, an Israeli who now is living in America is a professor of philosophy, he's also a, a journalist, and he and I have met, spent some time together. You've seen him on Shalom TV before, he's just extraordinary. And he said to me, Mark, I have a very special person I want you to meet. And he was right. <laughs> you were right. Thank you. That is Mark. just, thank you. You propel me in a direction, mm -hmm. and I just want to hear what your own vision is. I understand why, if I were an Arab Israeli, and it's interesting you said it doesn't matter, they have, met, they have citizenship, but they still might self-identify as Palestinian. If I'm a Palestinian and I'm living in Israel, and the siren goes off, which says, in essence, we are going to mourn the loss of all the Israelis who've ever died in battle with the Arab world trying to make the state of Israel real, as well as remembering all those who have died, al Kiddush Hashem, who are the generations that have brought us to, to Israel, many of whom have perished. There's a generation that perished in the Holocaust. If I'm a Palestinian, even if I'm an Israeli citizen, 
I have a hard time identifying with that siren because that siren also is reminding me as a Palestinian with any sense of the world that the people being mourned are people who also took the lives of some of my family and my people. This goes to the very essence of the dilemma that a loving Jewish state of Israel has for embracing and incorporating and trying to treat the Arab Israeli with as much dignity, let alone compassion, dignity, as one would the Jewish Israeli. And on the one hand, the state of Israel was created for the Jewish people. And very often, Amir, people no longer know history and they don't realize there was once a time when the Jew simply was not at home anywhere, including Western Europe. And American Jews who have the best diaspora experience in the history of our people. Very many young Jews have no clue what anti-Semitism is or was and why the state of Israel was essential for our people, not only, by the way, as a haven, but because that was our ancient homeland and we had our own commonwealth and we were a people, a nation like any other nation and there's no reason why there should be Italy and France and Spain and Poland and Ireland and Great Britain and not be in Israel. There's no right there should be a, any one of the many Arab nations and there should be an, a Jewish nation. But the Jewish nation had another goal. It was to be an open democracy that would embrace the non-Jew as well as the Jew. And there were Arab, Syrian, Palestinian, I don't care what you call them, there were non-Jews living in what was Palestine under the Ottoman Empire, what was Palestine in the League of Nations said to the British, you'll have a mandate to create a Jewish homeland in Palestine. There were Arabs there. And the Jewish people always said they can stay and be citizens like every Israeli. And it has been problematic from that moment on. I am setting up the following question for you. There is a difference between the ideal theory, the dreamer in you, understands what the dream of Zionism was. The dream where Jew and Arab would live together, arms around each other, but one, there was one implicit reality, that the Arab Israeli would feel a loyalty and an affection for the state of Israel and that whatever happened inside Israel would not be an insult to that Arab's sense of self and integrity. And that's not the way it's evolved. And my, quest, my long question for you is, you must ask yourself all the time, how does the modern state of Israel somehow work that dilemma out so that on the one hand, the Jewish state can have an integrity of its own, and we can have Yom Hazikaron for the Jews who have died al Kiddush Hashem, have lost their lives creating the state of Israel and creating the Jewish people, and at the same time have an Arab Israeli feel at home here, and that when he sings Hatikva, the fact that it's about Nefesh Yehudi, that the Jewish soul has been longing for this Jewish state, is not seen by the Arab Israeli as an offense to him. Is it in your mind, Amir, possible? Or is there an inherent intrinsic contradiction in the Zionist dream that will never permit this to be a reality? Mm -hmm. Now, it could be a reality. You know, when we talk about a dream, I think we should put down exactly what we really wish to be. Uh, we might dream at a certain house, at a certain street, at a certain point, and say, well, I want this number, that I want it to be mine, but there are people inside there. Is it really that what you're dreaming, to push them away, or do you want just the same shape of window and that path, the paved path inside, and the, the, the place for your car and so on? I think if we will put it down to see the details, then we'll find out there's no problem, actually. We could dream together and we could be together. 
as a Jew, actually, I wish to be as inclusive and as, a, as um, loving and co compassionate to the other as possible. This is just because I'm a Jew, you know. And actually, in the, in the Middle East, a guest is sometimes more important than your own family. That's how it is. I think it was when Abraham came and there were these um, malachim, the, 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 the angels who arrived to him and he, he washed their feet. It was not only because of his kindness, I think he was very kind, but not only because of that. That was how we do at that, at that area. And it is still true for Jews and for Arabs at the area. Uh, and therefore, you know, the, the neighbor is the most important and we could just reach the point. We should find how to bridge ourselves. In, okay. in Look, it may not be fair for me to ask you this question. I'm going to say it one more time because in my, my, my reaction to what you're saying is, of course, of course, but it doesn't speak to the issue. It doesn't speak to the fact that you have children, mm -hmm. Arab children in your school, mm -hmm. When you when you when that siren goes off, mm -hmm. that's a national siren. It's a siren that I think makes it a very important statement for the Jewish people, for the Israeli people, about the Jewish people, and about the state of Israel. I don't want to sacrifice that siren because there may be Israelis who are offended that that siren also represents for them as Arabs mm. some kind of negative. I, but why but does it I, represent any negativity? You know, actually, the Memorial Day for the Holocaust is not only Israeli. It happens in other places in the world, too. Just a minute. Do you want to tell your... Do you want to tell both Israelis and Arab... Arab Israelis and Jewish Israelis that the siren that goes off on Yom Hazikaron <laughs> is to commemorate the Arabs who fell in conflict with the state of Israel? No. Right. I want to say... You can't lie. No, no, no. You of can't lie. Not. But what I want to say, I want to change it inwardly. I want to start with myself and to check out what could be really inclusive. And you know, it starts when you love the children as, as your own. When I had my... Uh, these kids at, in the classroom, you know, uh, Rayan and Arin and Muhammad, as, as my children, really, saying the verses with them, Every day, you come to love them in a way that I didn't know about myself that I had any, any I barriers. Understand, I now, understand. now we come to the point, let me take it to the, the very extreme. Because actually, actually, I think the, this Memorial Day is not, is not the, uh, the, the hardest issue. The hardest point would be the, the tikva. Hi, tikva yeah. and that's what I think. To stand and to sing, yes. Nefesh Yehudi Humiya. The soul of the Jew yearns. Yes, I think we, we will have to find a way to make it inc inclusive. Must. And I think just then I could, and I'm sorry if I offend any of the, of the viewers, and maybe you, please forgive me, but only then I could sing myself the tikva full-hearted. Okay, I want you to know, first of all, you can't offend me. You are a lovely, lovely human being. We may disagree. You will never offend me. But I will tell you where I think you're wrong. I want the state of Israel to be a Jewish state. I want it to be for the state of Jews. I want it to be open to anybody who's not Jewish to live there. But I don't want to compromise. No, no, you don't have okay. to compromise. So, okay. We're together so, then. Okay, so we don't I'm, have to compromise. Okay, but I'm, I am not going to change Hatikva. I want it always to say, this state is the fulfillment of a 2,000-year-old vision and dream of the Jewish people. And, then, and, you, and you as an Arab yeah. are welcome to live here as long as you want to really be someone who contributes to this society. Yeah, but Mark, there's yet no disagreement here. There but must you're not be... ready to sing Hatikva, you tell me. No. What Why? I'm saying what bothers is... you now about Hatikva? No, no. Let me, let me just tell you, um, give you my, my way of thinking. It's a whole way of thinking now, I realize. Uh, what I see now is that we need something more creative. I'm not saying I have the, the answer. I know for sure that you need some, excuse me, some creativity. We need some inspiration. Yes, we have I, to look I elsewhere. I agree 100% with and, you. Yeah. Now, we could easily stick to the point and say, well, I see, no, no, it won't work, no. And then we start to disagree. But actually, we did not yet look at it, see how simple it could be. Maybe we need another song? Could you live with two songs? I don't know. I'm just thinking now, you know, maybe one more verse 
that would say what then later on happened and maybe not to force them to sing it at all to say okay we have this is the tikva that's the hymn you don't want to say that i don't know the minute you say they don't have to, the minute you tell kids in a classroom you don't have to stand or you don't have to sing you're acknowledging the problem the problem is that out of your sensitivity to their feelings which mm. i i applaud i celebrate I wish every one of us had the soul you have. You were gifted not only with music. You were gifted in many, many ways. Thank you. But the minute one says to a student, you're an Israeli, but you don't have to stand. You're an Israeli, you don't have to sing. In, you are endemic. It is endemic in that notion that you're saying there's no way to bridge the gap that, you know, that basically Ain Bustan is trying to bridge. And I, uh, I am just... I'm in awe of what Ain Bustan is trying to do. I don't know how real the outcome of it will be. I don't know what will happen to your third graders yes. when they become your age, ninth grade and tenth grade. Will they one day say to you, I appreciate your soul, but intellectually here, there's something dishonest about this. Intellectually. Well, you know what said uh, Khalil Gibran about the kids in the, in the book, The Prophet? Yeah? From an Arab, actually, origin, yes, it, Christian. And, it, and it's, probably, actually it's one of the greatest it, books ever written. And yes. And actually, uh, it, he wrote it in English, if I'm, if I'm not wrong. And he said, the kids are not yours. That is correct. They are the future. That's right. You are the past. That is right. Let they don't belong be, to you. Yes. They don't belong to you. Yes. So what I'm saying is, I think they will guide me. Anyhow, for the point, yeah, we, we don't know yet what's the answer. I just know that there is a problem. We'll get there. And I wish to tell you more about the school, you know, what happens now and to see how we celebrate, you know, and, and uh, the, the diversity and the other and how, actually, what are we doing? I'm, I'm not doing it for the Arabs. I'm doing it for myself. Mm -hmm. And actually, I started a kindergarten because I wanted something better for my son because I realized that actually he's not going to acknowledge the other if he will not have the other with him. And I wanted him just like, well, you're American. You know what is diversity. Absolutely. And you know how great it is. And we could argue and discuss, but at the end of the day, you, you, you see so many colors, far more than I. And uh, I wish just to celebrate our bit of colorful, you know. Yes, you so, know, I, I said this before, you have done something extraordinary. Yeah, now I'm, I'm coming back to, to this, you know, so we don't know what will be okay, the answer. But wait, I think that's the answer. Yeah. We don't know. We don't know yet. We don't know. Yes. And all we do is we acknowledge it's a very difficult problem it is. to bridge. Yes. yes. And we haven't figured it out yet. Therefore, we must find the right educational system. And that's why Enbustan okay. is using, you know, and different okay. methods. Good. And Let one, me come more, back. one more point. I think we should not forget, uh, if there is a um, disagreement between us, it might be the way we, uh, we treat kids anyhow. I'm not telling the kids that they don't have to stand and they don't have to, to, uh, to sing the tikva, not because they're Arabs. I say that the same for my kids. If you push them, if you make them have to, then they will never do it. You, you, will, you, you won't let the flower to grow here. Oh, it's very interesting. Yes, you, know, we, I, you I, should do that with yes, love. Well, I, if yes. you do it yourself, yes. then they will find out and they, they do it uh, their own, you know, for their own. I want to reinforce what you're saying. I want to say it this way. I am very often with, in, in, with, uh, in a situation where there are children and parents are with the children and something will happen and the parent will say to the child, say thank you. It just drives me crazy. Yes. If the child sees the father and mother always saying thank you, it'll emanate. Absolutely. It's not about say thank you. When the child feels thank you, then he will. He will and then it's real. You're saying the same thing. Exactly. You want it to exactly. come from within, inside the yes. child, whatever it is. Yes. Okay. And same, even worse, is with forgive me, you know, say slicha. Same That's thing. terrible. I agree 100%. Why? Because then you have two prisoners. Yes. One, the boy who, is, who was hitted and beaten, or I don't know what, and now he's punished because he now is waiting for the slicha. Maybe the other one won't give him forgiveness. Won't, when I, won't say slicha, sorry. And then what? He's a prisoner. I will say, no, no, but, but you didn't say slicha. I don't want to say slicha. So what, then what? Yes. So I teach just the vice versa. I and agree. the other prisoner I is agree. the boy. I say, if you, will give, if you go and say slicha, you might feel better yourself. And I say the other boy, 
If he says that, he didn't say slicha, I remind him, you don't have to forgive him. It's up to you. Yes. By the way, when somebody says slicha, forgive me, and it's honest, then you forgive. Absolutely. Yes. But it must be honest. Okay. Hmm. I want to come now to the school itself. Yes. When I read about the school, I said to myself, what I really want to hear from you. You're the dreamer. And by the way, parents helped you found this school. Absolutely. In yes. 2005. Yes. Okay. And you're now, it, it keeps growing. It starts simply as a preschool, then kindergarten. Yes. Now it's up to the third grade. The state of Israel basically finally gives you Heksher, and, and you are now. Real. A, real. Not yet. But not yet. Yeah, I no, it no, did. no. We're through a progress, actually. It's quite, it's not so easy, but oh, we will. Okay. Yes. What I really wanted to know was, to what extent are the Arab families, the Arab-Israeli families for whom children are in this school, and the Israeli parents who have their Jewish children in the school. And again, you know, it's interesting how nomenclature is so tricky, but it reflects something that instinctively I call the Jewish-Israeli-Israeli Israeli, and I call the Arab-Israeli Arab. Israeli, Arab. Yes, it reflects something, and but it it's fine. You're working with it very well. You know, I had that problem with the Israelis, <laughs> and it's far harder for them to, to catch the okay. language. What I'm really asking for is how do the parents of the respective communities, Arab-Israeli and Jewish-Israeli, how do they react and listen to me carefully? They wouldn't have their children in this school if they weren't supportive. What I really want to know is, how does the rest of their own community, where you have Arabs where the children are not in your school, yes. you have Jews, who, Jewish Israelis who don't have children in your school. Of course, yes. I want to know what the attitude is in the overall community, not simply among parents who have their kids in your school. Talk to me about how the school has or has not been accepted and embraced yeah. within society. So at 2005, September, when we opened, the mayor of Basmatabon, which is the Arab village where the, the kindergarten situated until today, he did not accept it, and he actually rejected and wrote a letter to the Ministry of Education that he doesn't want it to happen. And we have a, a disagreement, and I wrote letters to the, to the same, and at the end I could convince that actually it is needed because it's the will of the parents. And again, who's, so who wrote this letter? That's the mayor. The, which mayor? The, the mayer of Basmatabon, okay. of the, the, the village. Ar the, the Arab, Arab mayor. mayor of the okay. place, yes, okay? He did not like this he idea. He didn't like <laughs> Did he explain why? Uh, did you have an instinct yes. why? Yes, he why? said that actually we, uh, we harm the, uh, the identity of the Bedouin child, but... He forgotten that he himself learned with Jews from, from grade seven, and I, I told him that. But I don't want to tell any, any, any bad things about this man, because I think the most uh, uh, accreditable one who is the one who, who really could change. This man uh, ruled for four years or five years, and then he, he went away, and we had a different mayor, and he's just coming back, and now he's very positive. And now we're saying, okay, we should uh, communicate. I got it. I understand that actually it will not harm the identity. It might actually give some acknowledgement. I explained to him, actually, I want the AO level to be not only about the Israeli Jewish um, um, singer and, and the poets and, and so on and uh, artists and great figures, but only to, to acknowledge the Palestinian spirit. I think then as a Jew or for my for my kid then as a as a Jew he could really fulfill the dream to be am khufshi to be a free, people. free people in our place. Then I could sing it you know as I said with a halfway. full heart. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Cuz at the moment I feel no we are not really free. We are not free in the spirit. It is not because we got enemies around us. That's not the reason why we are not free. If you want to be free, be. It's not so easy. It's work to do. So um, at the beginning, we had many rejections. I had rejection also uh, from the, uh, the movement of the uh, anthroposophists, you know, the, the world of education, which we use as a bridge, because I found out that actually this method is great because we don't speak about certain things until the, a certain age and because we, uh, we, we start with a common base of nature and, and 
admiration and so on. Because uh, we don't ask, how does your God look like? And we just say, thank you, God, in both languages. And that could happen in, in a certain method. So also I had some rejection from these people saying, you should not expose the, the young child to a, a different uh, culture. It's too early. Nowadays, at the last seminar of the World of Education uh, held on July, I was just uh, in tears when people came to me to say thank you for what I'm doing and asking me to give them some verses in Arabic because they, go, they want to bring the Arabic to the Hebrew speakers. You know, 20% of the population are Jews in Israel. 20% are Arabs. We must speak that language. Then we will feel secure. what percent are Jews? 20, 80, sorry. 80% 80 and 20 are Arabs. The 80% Jews, Hebrew speakers, must start to speak the language of, of the other. It will change their lives towards the good, you know. It is not because they, well, I'm wrong in, in my language. They don't have to. They don't have to. But I really recommend. But it would be good for everyone. Absolutely. Okay. And it is so good for me. You know, I didn't speak Arabic before. I can speak Arabic. You can speak Arabic. I can Arabic. You I can, I can sing. Are you fluent? Not so. I, I speak, but you can but sing in Arabic. I, I can sing in Arabic. Arabic, yes. yes. Hopefully. Uh, we're almost out of time, and I want to give you a chance to address one more question that may be in some people's minds as they watch you. I think anybody who has spent this hour with, together with you comes away understanding you're a very lovely, special person. By the way, you're married with three children? Yes. Yes, we should make sure. All of them run through the kindergarten. Okay. Two of them now are in Hebrew-speaking uh, world of uh, okay. schools, but the little one might have the elementary. <laughs> okay. And again, I called you a dreamer. And I believe that there are some people who are watching who are saying the following to themselves. Lovely guy. Lovely. Wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody, both Jew, Arab, everybody in the world, had the soul that Amir has, is it realistic? And what does Amir really want? And I want to see what the answer to this question is. Mm -hmm. I want to create a world in which people accept diversity and we respect the other person's otherness without it being in any way a challenge to my own other, my own self identity, and I don't want to have to compromise who I am by accepting you. And there are some people who worry that if there is a universalist who says we are all one, inherent in that universalism is a subtle degradation of one's own particularity. I don't want to give up the notion of Israel being a Jewish state, and I don't want children to in some way be taught it doesn't matter who they are. It matters where you come from. But because you're a Jew, you will have the highest regard for the other person's sanctity, integrity, and their own otherness without it being a challenge or a, without it in any way affecting negatively your own sense of other. I, I, I would change to, just one word. I, I want to know the extent to which. Yes, I'm with you. Yes. you are you, or, or because there are some people who say what you say, but what they really believe is there shouldn't be a Jewish state. There should be a democratic state of Israel, but not a Jewish state of Israel. And I want to know honestly, mm. are you in the camp of the best thing would happen for Israel, it would be a democratic state, and there would be no distinction whether it was a Jew or a Muslim or a Christian. There would be no formal Jewish overlay to the state of Israel. Or I want are to you something? Yes. Yes. yes go yes. ahead. You understand my question now? Yes, absolutely. I understand the question, and I, um, I want just not to forget that it got nothing to do with the school, you know. And the, uh, and I, I want to explain why. Uh, well, you said that you want um, you, yes, you you use the word you as a Jew should accept the other because of you that being I'm a, a Jew. Jew. That's right. What I offer you, say I, not you. I as a Jew, accept the other because of my Judaism. I love and it, absolutely. You know why? Because you may let the other say the same as a Muslim. He might say, I, yes. as a Muslim. Yes. He doesn't have to be a Jew. Yes, into... I, I understand. Is it at, the moment, so, at the moment, 
I don't know how many Amirs there are in the yes, Arab world. Yes, yes. In the Arab world. You ask world. whether it is realistic, right? Y yes. Well, I'm we will afraid. never find out I'm unless we will start. Yeah, I'm only afraid that yes. I just want to make a statement. I got that so much to tell you. Wow, you Mark, we should you. meet again. Let's make this only chapter one. Yes, let's okay? make it only chapter You're, you one. You come around. Yes. You come to America often. I will. Okay. I will. Every time you come, you have to I, sit at this table. Thank you. I must tell you what happened to me when I find my fears. You know, when I sat and saw my, my little son going around a sort of Kaaba stone doing Eid al-Adha with the other. I didn't mind Muslims to, li to, to light candles in Hanukkah. That's lovely. But could I accept my son to say something from the Quran? I will only open the question. I will not answer now. Next time, Whoa. maybe. Yes. What a Think great, of that. Yes. What a great cliffhanger. But have I got others who could, could go with me the way? Well, I'm only a match. I'm telling you. You know, it runs now nine years because there are so good burning, you know, uh, uh, dry woods. And these, these people are doing really hard work with me all the time. And I had some rejection from all of the, all of the, um, uh, uh, the camps, you know, the, the, the Muslims, the Jews, the, all of them, the, the, uh, the movement, the educational movement. And I see that slowly the, the hearts are open and they understand, no, he doesn't want us to change. I'm the first one to praise diversity. Of course I want the identity. I, I'm a Jew. You know, when we will speak of how I get in contact with my father who passed away 13 years, uh, years, uh, years away, uh, you, will, you will understand. There's no other way for me but Judaism, in my own way. And because I'm a Jew, I could inter interpret it the way I want it. And you too, I know you do that. And all, all you people, you choose what, how you want to be of a Jew. Of course. Of course. And it, that's why I came to America probably. That's the first place who would praise this freedom and I think America is leading in, in a way I'm a Jew but still I accept this leadership of America because there's something in that spirit yes. that was done yes. here and I want to follow yes. and I want to take it to the Middle East and it is possible yes, yes. Okay. it's realistic okay. and bottom line for you Israel should be a Jewish democratic state or only a democratic state my state always will always be Jewish but it might, you know, I might have someone else who will be the same. Absolutely. Place. Yes. Amir, you're fabulous. You <laughs> know, you. and I thank you, Alan, for bringing us together. We will meet often. But what you're doing is very special. And I hope everybody understands the soul that's inside you. And in many ways, you are the best of what we want to be. Keep dreaming. Always dream, my friend. Always thank you. Thank you, so much. thank you. My conversation with Amir Shlomian, founder and co director of Ain Bustan. A school where Jewish and Arab children are learning together and hopefully becoming friends. Of course, as always, I hope you'll share your own thoughts and comments to some of the things that Amir had to say. Please email me, write me, post on our Facebook wall, tweet me. I look forward to hearing from you. And by the way, if you want to help support Amir and his work, please visit us in einbustan.org. Um, and if you want to support, you'll find a way how to do that. That's Thank beautiful. Thank you so much. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. <laughs>We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support. L'chaim is a presentation of Jewish Education in Media.